So I would say uh, we can move move on to our second speaker if uh, he is ready uh, for this evening, Dr. Mohammed Salama. He is a professor at the Department of uh, Laboratory Medicine and Path uh, Pathology at the Mayo Clinic Hospital in Rochester, Minnesota. And he is the chief medical officer of Mayo Clinic Laboratories. His clinical interest in uh, hematopathology include morphology, flow cytometry, molecular tests, and other specialized studies of bone marrow and lymph node pathology. He will be talking about transforming diagnostic malignant hematology through artificial intelligence. I would like to thank him for joining us this evening. Dr. Salama, the mic is yours. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Um, and uh, for I would like to thank the attendants and um, for their time. And I would like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you today uh, with this uh, exciting uh, um, topic um, session. So um, this is going to be the outline of what we will do in the next 25 minutes. Uh, we will start with some relevant historic perspective. We'll talk about the, uh, the promise of the digital pathology and AI. Um, we also will, will uh, stress the fact that AI is beyond digital pathology, and we'll touch on this. I mean, there's going to be areas in flow cytometry and some of the other tools that we use um, every day. We will talk about the limitation in the field. Um, and then we'll, we'll try to address this in a, in a way that we view, or at least on, my, on our end here, we view how AI is going to come in the lab and the diagnostics, particularly with relation to testing some, uh, some uh, pre-analytical elements, um, uh, analytical elements of the testing and the post-analytical elements. Um, I would like to start with a little bit of a background um, addressing the evolution trends in the clinical lab that we see today. So we all are dealing with increased biological information, increasing in the, in, uh, technological innovation, and actually increasing clinical demands. All of this um, results into any qualitative is becoming quantitative. All of our assays now are becoming quantitative. It's not good enough now to say um, uh, there is a FLIT3 or not. You want to know how much FLIT3 is going to be, or if there is a mutation, what's the uh, uh, mutation burden? Um, there is increased reliability uh, on our testing with increased analytical precision um, uh, of our testing. Also, there is uh, these results are uh, tied directly now into treatment. They are not just for diagnosing uh, entity anymore. I think there is a looks like there is an error. You can uh, keep talking, Dr. Salam, until they fix your uh, okay. presentation. Sure. Um, yeah, I am actually uh, connecting through my, I'm sharing the, the presentation from here. So uh, the promise of digital pathology and AI, this is going to be directly connected to the, um, uh, uh, into the, the microscope. We are not going to rid of the microscope. We are not going to rid of what we do in the lab. It's actually going to be more valuable and more efficient. So. As you noticed from the um, what I had there, I mean, I had somebody looking at the microscope and there are pictures in front of him. So it, what we anticipate in the future that every image-based pathologist is going to be using computer-assisted analytical tools in the future. Um, the, um, Yeah, and I, I shared my and I, and I shared the presentation with Tati earlier. Um, but I'm, I'm sharing from my computer as well. Share it to your computer, please. Okay, share it again, please. Please, please. So um, um, AI, digital pathology enables AI, and we'll talk about this in a second. 
Uh, but AI, again, I'm stressing it actually extends beyond uh, imaging. Um, the, we anticipate also there's going to be increased reliance on pathology as um, um, as we uh, as we we have more um, AI and more widespread use of digital pathology. So a little bit of a, a historic perspective from the early 20th century um, until today, there have been only three revolutions. The first revolution was in the in the field of pathology. First revolution was 1980 with the immunohistochemistry, and then early 2000 was next generation sequencing and molecular. And now in the uh, in 2008, we're starting to see a third revolution of digital pathology, and it really is in in and and a tool that that enables really artificial intelligence. Um, the digital pathology is not new; it existed since 1968, and artificial intelligence is not new. We talked about artificial intelligence in 1956, um, but what happened 1968? The first image was transferred, digital image transferred between Logan Airport and Mass General Hospital. But it took a while for it um, because of the efficiency of the uh, the computer performance, and it wasn't until the late 90s where the internet came in place, and there are, there are, we started again to talk about digital pathology. The same thing for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence have existed a long time back, but why now is surfacing? Because the data are digital. We have access to a lot of data. In the 60s and 70s, all of our works in the hospital was paper form. There was really not much digitized form. So we have now the material, and this is where the opportunity exists for us. Um, one thing I want to point out when I refer to artificial intelligence, we always say AI for artificial intelligence. I actually like to refer this for augmented intelligence, and it's also referred to as AI. The reason why this is important because artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence or AI does not mean it's going to replace us. It's actually going to make us better. It's going to make us more efficient. It's going to make us actually more um, capable. And we will talk about some of this. So why, why do we want to switch digital? Our predecessors in radiology have um, confirmed, actually, that image quality, access, consistency, and workflow can be greatly improved with um, digital workflow. In the lab today, uh, we know counting cells or counting bone marrows, this is a very labor-intensive process. This is not standardized, difficult to train people, and no historic images. If one of my trainees bring me a slide and say, this have a blast here, Dr. Salama, can you look at it? Now I have to look through the whole slide to find the cell and I may or may not find it because it may not have existed to begin with, or I'm not convinced that it's a blast. Um, there's also improved traceability of these cells. Um, just to give you a very brief um, comparison, what really the difference about looking at a slide on a, on a microscope and a, a slide, this is a preferred smear. If you look at certain area, you, look, you zoom in the microscope, and you can see the, I can tell this is a neutrophil because of the segmented nuclei. But if you go into uh, the insets there, you see in inset A, there is a, a small granule, and this granule is made by 16 pixels. And depending on the mathematical way of the quality of this image and the way these are done, do you take averages? Am I going to be able to use this or not on the image? Because in the microscope, I actually zoom up and down. I can go higher magnification. And if I don't see it, then I may call this patient had myelodysplasia, hypogranular uh, preferred smear. And then you may need to do uh, a bone marrow biopsy and, and so on. So there is quite a bit of limitation. Uh, we probably, most of us are familiar with the format of files. So any given whole slide image is made of almost 50,000 different um, small tiles that you put in a wrapping like this pyramid. And you zoom in the pyramid depending on, on your top of the pyramid or the bottom of the pyramid where you see how uh, much details on the cells. But one of the major limitations I want to point out here, why heme path uh, didn't go as fast as other area in surgical pathology, because it takes a long time. We did this study several years back, and to scan a, a two by two millimeter area on the slides, you need eight minutes. You need 16 minutes to scan nine by nine millimeter area on 100x oil, which is impossible if you have a lab that makes hundreds of slides every day, it's impossible to scan everything. Now, this is improved. There is a lot of new scanners in the market. Um, and, I mean, the, the couple of the scanners that I'm showing here actually are have promised. There was one um, uh, Chinese uh, manufacturer that have promised that they will have a whole slide scan under 30 seconds uh, by the end of the year. And I think they are, they are getting close there. 
Um, I would like to think of this as a pathologist-centric system where AI, you can scan the whole slide, the whole slide is given to the pathologist, the pathologist is going to be looking at slides to make the diagnosis and then reporting. So artificial intelligence and AI can be at the beginning, I mean pre-analytical, before the, the pathologist, um, and we'll talk about this uh, in a second, and could be actually even later after the diagnosis, in addition to the function in the diagnosis. And obviously the quality control goes all the way across during all the time, can be running in the background all the time. So this is a way that I preview the AI in clinical laboratory. We'll talk about some examples in the pre-analytical uh, case assignment, uh, screening slides, pre-order of stains. We'll show you a few examples. The analytical, basically how you classify cells, how you make the diagnosis, how you assist in the, making a differential diagnosis. And then the post-analytical as directed, basically do repeated functions and, and maybe even natural language processing where you can generate the report that's specific for a patient based on a specific function. So when the pathologist come or the technologist they come, they can, they, they can do things in, in five minutes instead of 25 minutes. Um, and obviously, we'll talk also about flow cytometry because there is a lot of work have been done in flow cytometry that I would like to share with you. Uh, we'll start with the pre-analytical. Uh, and before we do that, I want to give you a, a very high level, basic understanding of what really the difference between machine learning and deep learning. Machine learning is what we have done, we have been doing for the last 10, 15 years with image analysis. Basically, you train the machine, the computer, to learn to do certain function, the same way we learn in our life. And basically, it can, you can, you, essentially, if this is a Hodgkin, as the example I showed there, you have to go and mark the cell and tell the computer, this is a Hodgkin or cell, and go and find all the Hodgkin cells for me. Deep learning is different because you really do not have to train the computer. The computer can go and find, you basically give two sets of data and the computer can go and find its own uh, features that different than what I look in my eye or my brain can recognize. And usually we do this through convolutional network. So um, if in, we, we have taken advantage of this um, by applying this to some lymphoma. I will take you through the study to explain more and essentially what you do each one of those layers that i had there the convolution neural network is composed of images portion of the image which we call kernels kernels is a group of pixels and each layer is dependent on the layer before it and learn certain features from it depending on the pixels the colors the texture and they 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 make mathematical combination of things and they teach the next layer and then the when when you write these the, the engineers when they write these uh, layers, they at the end, they, they, they group the, the cells based on this finding in one of those at, at the last layer in a group A or B or C, and this is how you get your answer. So we did the same thing a few years back, and we wanted to answer the question a couple of years ago, and we wanted to answer the question, can the computer tell real the Burkitt lymphoma from diffuse large B cell lymphoma and say, this is a Burkitt or a diffuse large B cell lymphoma? And we use the exact same principles that I showed you. We don't have to go into the details, but essentially we created um, um, into the concept. And essentially the, the, the system went very well into, um, into giving us the probability of, of uh, making the distinction. Uh, what was in our mind at that time was, is, was very simple, um, that we, we wanted to use this in a pre-analytical. So the sample would come, it may take me three days, because day one, I look at the um, diffuse large B cell lymphoma or Burkitt lymphoma, I do 3 and 20, I can tell it's B or a T cell process, it goes next day um, to the immunostains, the second round come, uh, I can tell it's a B cell lymphoma, um, and then I order the cell of origin, and uh, maybe the third day I can get, is it uh, BCL2 or BCL6? However, if I have a fellow, that, that AI fellow that I'm, that's looking at a microscope here, that come, that works, the slides actually, people in the lab, they come at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. They do the histology. I come later in the lab, the, the fellow already have looked at it, the AI, they can tell with a very high level of accuracy, almost 99%, this is a diffuse large B cell lymphoma, this is not a Burkitt lymphoma. The stain round, it can detect the, the, the top group because there is a very high likelihood of, of, uh, um, of, 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 of accuracy. Uh, we'll start the stains by the time I come at 10 o'clock, I have the stains, I can sign the case on time by 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock because I have the stains 
the report is already written for me, it changes the practice. And now, instead of three days for getting a diagnosis, you get four or five hours to get the diagnosis. And obviously, the efficiency, I'm not going to talk about efficiency and the money and, and all of that, because now you are ordering things that you know what it is. And the, there's also other questions that we are starting to ask now. Can I predict from the HNE only a, a double expressors or not? Do I have, um, do I, can, I, can I identify the 70% of the uh, uh, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma that can respond to the r chop or the 30% that's not going to respond and automatically I'm going to have them to DICE or RISE or any of the other um, algorithms. There is a lot of uh, publication in this area and we don't have to talk about uh, the details of follicular lymphoma and others, but you get the, the concept. The other area that uh, I would like to uh, point out too is um, like APL, the diagnosis of APL. We know that within, if the patient is not diagnosed within 48 hours, uh, the, the mortality goes more than 50% or even 24 hours, the mortality goes significant. So the question becomes, can we uh, predict if it's APL or not with translocation 1517 with higher level of accuracy up front even before the flow cytometry comes? Um, I'm going to move now to the analytical because, the, and I will go relatively quick here, the, um, why do we want to automate the manual differential for the cells? Uh, because of availability of medical technologists, uh, a greater level of standardization, likelihood, and demand of connectivity between the healthcare provider, particularly you as a provider. Um, so you can see what, what happened in real life. I would be looking at a microscope, we'll be seeing a, a field like this on the left side. I'd be counting the cells, but you would have a, a, a system like Cellavision or any of the other similar systems can organize the cells for you. This will make my life. Uh, much better, I would be extremely happy. Um, I believe any hematopathologist in the call will be as well. Uh, there are many system exist. Um, Cellavision, they, they come in a, a separate system or in a modular form um, with Sysmix or others, but uh, they, they, the difference really between these different systems um, exist in the way the, the number of cells they provide, number of classes and all of that. These systems, they can allow you to visualize the cell in high resolution. They allow you to um, look at the red blood cells with the tool assist, with assisted tools, with counts. You can organize the cells based on their shape, size, uh, maybe annotated spherocytes pointed out and so on and so forth. So basically increase performance. All of these systems, they use a knowledge based artificial neural network algorithms that employ hierarchical structure classification rule that mirrors our manual teaching process, essentially what we use to train our trainees and, and, and fellows. And um, the, um, the, um, uh, this, this is how it started maybe about eight or nine years ago. We started um, uh, some of the machine learning concept where we're able to, in our lab actually, where, where we train, we, we, we use the simple triangulation um, uh, um, uh, um, method to for the computer to identify a cell as neutrophils or not. Um, but again, this this have taken significantly faster into deep neural network now where um, we see the accuracy have improved significantly. And again, the same concept that I showed you before, uh, but a cell based and not, not a tissue based. And you see the accuracy have improved significantly. We actually now doing some work where from the h &E only, we can look at 800 features per cell and we can look at clustering. So we actually can take clonality from just h &E or right stain based on the cells they cluster together, cells look like together. So there is a lot of advances. This is gonna take quickly, very fast. I anticipate within the next 12 months, um, a lot of um, prediction in morphology is gonna uh, is going to take over. However, we have to address the limitation. One of the limitation addressed is the scanning systems, but the uh, another limitation is actually all the data that we look in the literature are very significant when you are comparing two mo mods, normal or abnormal, blast or not blast, um, neutrophils or platelet, oh, sorry, neutrophils or lymphocytes. But once you start getting into a higher level of um, um, the the um, uh, um, challenges basically when you challenge system started to go down. So this is a group. This is a Spanish group that they have looked at um, lymphocytes. If do you look at APL, uh, Perkett lymphoma, CLL, uh, um, uh, margin zone lymphoma, or S uh, uh, um, uh, 
mantle cell lymphoma and a peripheral blood cell. So they looked at all the lymphoid and different diseases, and you can see the sensitivity dropped significantly. They used about 4,600, 46,000 digitized cells. So obviously, we cannot tell exactly what they used in their, new ne their neural network, but the point here, as we challenge the system with more possibilities, the efficiency is going to go down. So there's a lot of work to be done as well. Why this is important? The international um, um, uh, uh, um, Society for um, Standardization of Hematology, um, they recommended actually that all the labs give numeric values. And if you look at the uh, everywhere in the world, uh, so if you look on the right side, for you to call anisocytosis, I have to count how many anisocytosis or polychromagia or acanthocytes or echinocytes or schistocytes. And I have to tell you if it's, uh, uh, if it's two plus or three plus based on the count. And they vary from one to the other. And it's impossible for anybody to do this manually. So these systems are going to be essential for our progression. Why this is important, uh, important because connectivity and what this mean to you, this, this actually slides from my friend, uh, Dr. Pintanovitz, they did at the University of Pittsburgh, where they actually looked about 300, um, 3.4 million images. Um, and they actually, they took it from the Scylla vision, they put it on their server, and actually they made connectivity through the CBC to the clinician through the EMR. So at you as a clinician, when you open the, the, the chart, you click on the um, on it. You actually can see the cells, and you can review it as well in your clinic or from your cell phone. Um, assisting the differential diagnosis. Uh, this is a, a study I would refer to that was done by the same group. They looked at feature extraction um, for cell segmentation based on the region, the cytoplasm regions, and the the surrounding cells. And they look at geometric features, color, cytoplasm for five different diseases. Um, and the normal lymphocytes and, and, and like hairy cells, CLL, mantle cells, and um, uh, uh, blast, acute, uh, um, uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And you can see here on the left side, this is the true value, the gold standard or the ground truth on the, uh, on the left side. On the top, what's the system predicted just from the looking at the image of, of the cells. And um, you can see the performance. You can, they can tell you with 99. 5% accuracy, this lymphocytes is normal or abnormal. Um, or they can tell you with 97 or 98% accuracy, this is CLL or mantle cell lymphoma. Obviously, this is gonna, um, needs to be uh, uh, confirmed. But this is another study that actually I would like to, from a Japanese group, um, just came recently, where they, they looked at uh, more than 700, almost 700,000 um, cell image from 3,000, 30, over 3,000 peripheral blood smears, and they classify the cells into uh, 17 um, groups uh, with 97 morphologic features. On the right side, you'll see what's called TISNI or the distributed schematic neighborhood uh, embedding. And this is basically a multi-dimensional reduction. So you can take thousands of dimensions and you put them in two dimensions. And they were able to separate them, these cells with a very high level of accuracy. Now, what they did next, they actually looked at um, the peripheral smears from MDS and aplastic anemia. We know this is a difficult diagnosis for patients with cytopenia. And they actually, you can see they were able to separate them with a very high le level of accuracy, particularly for the top three entities, which I think was pseudo hue, the nuclear shape, and the cytoplasmic granularity. Um, what's impressive here is that they were able to identify, the, to make this distinction with uh, more than 99, an area under the curve uh, of 0.99 with a very high sensitivity, uh, very high specificity and 100% sensitivity. That we know, we all know that this is a difficult um, diagnosis, but if you if you can tell, if I can tell you as a clinician that this upfront from a peripheral sphere, this patient had a very high likelihood to be an MDS or a plastic anemia, then you may choose your testing or I may choose my testing even before they or even decide if I want to do a bone marrow or follow the patient later on, or even start the patient or, or a given therapy, a different therapy. This is this is not only one group. There are other groups are starting to show the same thing now. This is the same Spanish group that I told you about. They are able to tell from the just the peripheral blood if the cells have a dysplasia or not with a very high level of accuracy with an area under the curve of 0.99, almost 100%. Uh, this goes beyond the morphology. So this is another group. Uh, from uh, San Diego, University of California, San Diego, where they looked at the, the um, um, uh, 
and the, when, when you get a preference smear and I tell you there is a blast there, they actually applied an AI on, on sets of questions on the electronic medical records. And, and they asked sets of questions for those patients within 30 days um, of the identification of a blast. Simple questions like, did the patient had received stem cell mobilization or not? Did have corticosteroids, the patient had infection? Was there is other abnormalities or not? LDH and, and so on. And the answer for those that are neoplastic or not was significant in all of them if the patient had uh, neoplastic or reactive. So again, this is where we think the value is gonna come into the medical record. And we are doing some of this here now with our clinician, even in our inbox. We have actually a project that I'm doing now with Dr. Al-Kai, um, Arif Al-Kai, um, where we are, we are actually looking at the prioritization within Mayo Clinic of the what notification to go to the, the consultant based on the AI and, and the um, um, uh, and sensitivity. I'm going to go very quickly on the uh, on the flow cytometry, and just just to give you an example, uh, I picked this publication from the University of Utah, where I used to work before I moved to Mayo Clinic a few years back, um, because I'm familiar a little bit with their system as well. So they used uh, more than 3,000, um, 3,400 uh, cases, uh, and they used what's called the UMAP, which is a fe fe feature extraction and dimensionality reduction I talked about. Uh, using a single tube. It's a single B-cell tube, thin color B-cell tube. Um, and then they follow this by a random forced classification for cases without getting on any specific population. So basically, they took FCS files and they applied in the algorithm, no gating, and were able to uh, test it. And I'm just showing you a single case to give you an idea of how this works. This is a single case, and we look per marker like on the CD10, that big population in red there, we know that these are neutrophils or granulocytes based on the fact of their expression of CD10 and where they are on the, um, so where they are on the slide scatter. You have, you have five minutes to complete your yeah. talk. Yeah, two more slides, two more slides will be done. So 95%, um, I mean, with, with the B-cell malignancy, they were able to tell abnormalities or B-cell malignancy, 95% of accuracy based on this B-cell tube. Um, if you look at the CLL with the area under the curve, was even better. Um, the, the algorithm didn't work very well on the T cells, which is expected because this is a B cell. What was unusual is that the AML, detection of AML, was actually worked very well, um, which is, I assume, it's because of um, the, some of the um, side scatter and 45. What's interesting here is that they, when they adjusted the cutoff, the classifier cutoff, into 100% sensitivity, um, they propose that almost 11% of the cases, they could be with 100% confidence can be released without no human touches it. So essentially it comes from the machine, goes through the system um, and with zero chance of error there. No technician, no human can. Obviously this is theoretical, there's gonna be a lot of validation on that, but this is gonna be the future. Where we think the future is going to be in the healthcare. Essentially we're gonna have a tissue-based information, next-gen sequencing, molecular, flow, all of these, they are gonna go into, with the data science, they are gonna go into diagnosis, prognosis, companion diagnostics, and obviously you can add the clinical outcome to this, and this is where the magic is gonna happen. Um, this has already have been done in other area in pathology where it had been confirmed that the, um, the AI can predict uh, outcome, um, disease progression, and mutation. The last slide for me here is where the value, everything we have to develop in the future have to improve patient safety, improve efficiency, improve service quality and optimization of our work as a workforce, whether uh, clinician, uh, pathologist, technicians, technologists, uh, healthcare staff. Um, I just wanna point out that one of the major limitations is going to be the industry. The industry will not invest in this area unless they see the re return on investment. And actually this goes back to us as healthcare providers and as practitioners. Um, this is the summary, uh, we talked about the promise in this area of AI and diagnostic workflow, we talked about some of the limitations and we talked about the importance in the last slides of the practitioners being engaged in all stages of design. With this, I would leave you with the last quote, our imagination is the only limit to what we can hope to have in the future. And thank you again, and would like to take questions.